Hello and welcome to C++ Weekly. I'm your host Jason Turner, available for code reviews and on-site training. Now in this episode, I wanted to cover this little bit of the command and conquer source code that we found when I was doing the code reviews uh, last year. And you can check out a link in the description for that live code review. And now forgive me because I have Sea Lion here set up uh, just barely enough for us to be able to browse through the source code. There's some file naming issues and stuff on the command and conquer source code when it comes to browsing on Linux. But we found things like this, this IPX manager class mono debug print. And if we clicked into here, we saw this mono print function. Let's go ahead and go back to its definition here. So this is in the mono.h file. And this doesn't give a whole lot of information. It just says mono.h and it has a mono thing. And it says, okay, line drawing on a monochrome screen is really made up of characters. It specifies which characters to use. It doesn't give us a whole lot of information. Now at the time, I commented, oh, they were able to use the monochrome screen for debug output. So if we go back to this IPX manager, we can see that they've got this debug print. And so when you were doing a network enabled game with red alert, they could actually print to the monochrome screen debug information here. If you're not familiar with this, you might be a little surprised at monochrome screen in a VGA game. So let's take a look at what that means. Now, if you've been a PC user for a while, you may be aware that it wasn't until 1998, specifically in Windows 98, that Microsoft Windows actually supported dual monitor here we go, multi-monitor support, was added in Windows 98. We're talking about DOS era games. It turns out that there were certain hardware configurations where you could actually have multiple monitor support, even if Windows didn't support that. Now, if you are so inclined, you can find this article here, Dual Head Operation on a Vintage PC, and it runs over some of the whys and hows that this can work. And if you scroll through, you'll see that there's only a few things mentioned that took advantage of this, such as the RHIDE or RIDE, perhaps that is meant to be pronounced. Now that is a relatively modern IDE for DOS, and you can actually use this uh, today in DOSBox or something like that. And I might cover that in a future episode, but it could use dual monitor support for debugging. And there were actually options for DOS to have a secondary monitor as output. What you could have, and this article goes in detail here, is a monochrome adapter plus something else. It could theoretically be a CGA adapter, a VGA adapter, or an EGA adapter. Now, they had to use the same type of bus. They either had to be both 8-bit or both 16-bit, or they had it to be an 8-bit or 16-bit adapter for your monochrome and perhaps PCI or one of the 32-bit or 64-bit or whatever buses for the VGA card. In this era, there was not the possibility of doing plug in and play. When you plugged in a device, it had a very specific expectation of where it was supposed to live and what its ports were. So you can see here that EGA for text used the B10,000 range for addresses and for mono graphics, the A1000 for color text, the B8000 and the A1000 for color graphics, that's EGA. And VGA, it points out here, is pretty much a superset of EGA. Hercules was always in the B1000 here. And so it's possible B8000 or A1000 here for our color graphics. So we have memory address ranges and IO ports that don't necessarily overlap between the devices. 
If we look at this graphically from this little chart from the computer desktop encyclopedia, we can see that we've got our 0 to 640K here, and this is why DOS was limited to 640K, because the memory was pre-divided up for various things. And then at the A1000 range, and we see here the upper 16 bits is A000, and the lower 16 bits starts at 0000. Uh, this was segmented memory in 16-bit era of PCs. And then the monochrome graphics adapter starts at this B000 address space. So we could write data into the EGA or VGA buffer and separately write data into the monochrome display adapter buffer. Now, if we scroll back over to mono C.h in our red alert source code, we can see this little construct here. It is getting a pointer to the start of the monochrome memory buffer. So it is a doing a direct cast of B0000. Now, if you're paying attention, this doesn't look quite the same. We've got two different ways of looking at this. This is the 32-bit address range instead of the 16-bit address range, segmented versus flat memory access. So we've got this B0000, same idea. That's the start of the monochrome graphics adapter. And if we start writing data into there, that's going to show up on the monochrome screen instead of the primary screen. If we go to this article from Nerdly Pleasures from April 28th, 2012, we can find a list of games and programs from the DOS era that had weird hardware support. We can see this list of games that had secondary monochrome monitor support. And I have actually tried all three of these games and the only one that I could actually get to work is the Mahjong VGA. Now, this specifies that it will display information about the remaining tiles. This seems to be intentional. MechWarrior 2 and Rise of the Triad show debugging information, which this article claims was unintentional. I don't know if there's anything to back this up, that this was an unintentional capability. Regardless, they would show game debugging information. Now, I have not been able to get MechWarrior 2 Mercenaries or Rise of the Triad to actually display information in the setup that I have, but I have gotten the Mahjong VGA, and I can demonstrate that now with uh, the special build of DOSBox that it mentions. Now, there's a special build of DOSBox, and there's also DOSBox X. I don't know too much about the history and who runs the DOSBox X fork, but it is another fork of DOSBox that tries to keep it maintained and updated and that kind of thing. This one, it doesn't advertise it anywhere in the docs that I can find, but it does support the exact same feature that the special fork of DOSBox from back in 2012 support. And basically it looks like this. When you go to launch DOSBox, you say that you want a second display. Now keep in mind, you have to have one of the special forks of DOSBox that supports this. You say you want display to, and you say what color you want the background to be. Now when you launch DOSBox, it's going to take what would have been the status window previously and make that the secondary display. And if everything worked correctly here, what we have is our secondary display in the bottom right and the primary display in the upper left. My DOSBox has been acting up a little bit. I don't know if it's because it is this random fork or not, but let's go ahead and launch Mahjong VGA so you can see what this looks like. And according to the document here that we were just looking at, we need to launch Mahjong with a D parameter to tell it to go into dual display mode. And honestly, I think this is pretty darn cool. All right, so there we go. Now note, I did say green, but I didn't actually get a green display here. And I'm not entirely sure what's going on with that, but I can actually go in and change the properties of the windows. We, we do need this to have a... Uh, nice green display if we can pull that off. Nope, I cannot get the background color of it to change, but that's fine. Okay, so it's not going to look green, 
but we can play our game and see on our secondary display a live update. We now only have right here two of the four dot tiles remaining. This is also the same information you would have gotten if you had hit the what's left here and it tells you all of the things. This is an actual game actually released for DOS back in the day that supported dual display. It's pretty clear why not more games would have taken advantage of this because, you know, honestly, who was actually running a dual monochrome display or not. But it seems like the kind of thing that a lot of game developers took advantage of as a way to display debug information while they were actually working on the project. It seems like a pretty cool and helpful thing to do. We gave this overview of how it works by actually showing that it is a memory layout thing, that if we write into the A thousands, we're going to be writing to the display or B8 thousand, and we're writing to the display for the primary display. And if we write into the B000 range, then we'll be writing to the secondary monochrome display. I've been working on what is possibly the worst written example for this in 16-bit assembly. Due to some technical problems here, I had to end up switching over to DOSBox X, which is why you can now see the menus at the top of the screen and we can configure and do things, but I have it laid out basically exactly the same. So on the topic of my almost certainly the most poorly written possible assembly here for 16-bit assembly, yes, you can use a relatively modern version of BIM in your DOS here. So what we have is I'm setting up this index here, register of B000, I have to set that into some register first, and then I can copy it into the ES register, some other segment register. And then I've got uh, some index register here, and I'm saying I want to move the byte 41 into the address that is pointed to by ESDI. Now I'm gonna go ahead and comment out the rest of these things here. The memory layout of the monochrome display, uh, the MDA adapter specifically, is value and then attribute, value, attribute, value, attribute, which I believe is backward from the memory layout for EGA and VGA text. But we definitely need to make sure we return back to DOS when we're done with this program. So this should write the value A to the upper left corner of the monochrome display. I think that's right. That should be 41, should be A. That's ASCII here. Uh, it does have its own character chart. I actually have NASM installed here and I can do a NASM here of this uh, MDA.assembly. And I'm gonna call this MDAout.com. Uh, and that should be all that, that would take. There we go, it assembled with no errors. And then I should be able to run mda.out, and if we did this right, we'll see an A appear in the upper left corner of the monochrome display. And there we go. We have an A in the upper left corner of the monochrome display. These other things, you know, I was just playing around with incrementing the bytes here. And we could do something like this, and now we would expect to see A, B. Now I notice I had to skip two bytes. There we go, A, B printed in the upper left-hand corner. So you can see starting from these building blocks, it'd be relatively easy to build something that just outputs whatever debug information that you want to to that secondary screen. I'd be remiss here to not at least try to write something to our current DOS window, right? So let's go ahead and try that. Now, is this going to be the B800 or is this going to be the A memory location? You know what? 
I'm not entirely sure. So let's just give this a try and see what happens if I write a memory to this particular location. And I'm going to write it at, say, a 100 byte offset. Uh, no, let's write it at an 160 byte offset. So that would be not in hex. I want that to be in decimal. 160, so it's an 80 column display, 160 bytes offset from the upper left hand corner. Although I need to multiply that by two to take into account the attribute bits. Then I uh, attribute bytes, that is, oh, uh, plus one, I guess. So that should put something on the third line down from the top. Uh, let's see what happens. We're going to try to write this A and B again in that location. Now, I did not see anything visible output on our primary display. Uh, there we go. So we can see that I actually was off by one and I set the attribute bytes, not the value bytes. So I've gotten this right here where I've changed the background and foreground colors of our letters that were currently on the display. That's pretty funny. There we go. Now we have capital A, capital B displayed right here and capital A, capital B displayed in the um, monochrome display as well. So there you go. That, that's the, the absolute bare bones, simplest way in which these things were used. Now, if I put this thing in VGA mode and I was writing to the A thousand range, then I'd be writing pixels to the VGA portion of the screen, similar to what we are looking at in that Mahjong VGA game. Now, I might build on this episode a little bit in the future, so I hope that you thought that this was at least a little bit interesting. It was fun for me. If I cover this in the future, it's going to be with a very, very obscure language that I assure you very few people have actually used uh, on who are watching this on this channel. So thanks for watching the, this episode of C++ Weekly. Be sure to subscribe because you want to check out that obscure language when and if I ever cover it.